because we can't get there from here without change. But in 2019, a study of more than 6,500 12 to 15 year olds in the U.S. found that those who spent more than three hours a day using social media might be at heightened risk for mental health problems. Another study, 12,000 13 to 16 year olds in England found that using social media more than three times a day predicated poor mental health, predicted poor mental health and well-being in teens. Other studies also have observed links between high levels of social media use, depression or anxiety. The average millennial checks their phone 157 times daily. I don't know how a member of the Senate, I don't know where we fall. Social media is designed to sustain users' attention with a mix of good user interface design and psychology creating an addictive mix for users. It's called the slot machine effect, a technique which utilizes a pull to refresh and scrolling mechanisms on news feeds similar to a slot machine. The light button, a feature to provide social validation through a positive feedback loop by measuring and comparing the number of likes a user's content obtains. Gaming fine social interactions, employing gamification uh, to engage users and keep them coming back. For example, streaks is the one causing the most concern and using elongating red lines to display the number of days since two users interacted. I guess what these technologies do is try to keep us engaged. The more we engage the technology, the more advertising benefit to the company. Is that a good business practice? Maybe so. Does it create a health hazard over time? Something to look at. Now, the other aspect of this debate is are these companies newspapers or their TV stations, do they have the power of, um, of media organizations that have rules and regulations and the current uh, media platforms do not? There are rules about what a television station can do. There are rules about what a newspaper can do. Uh, and what I want to try to find out is if you're not a newspaper at Twitter or Facebook, then why do you have editorial control over the New York Post? They decided, and maybe for a good reason, I don't know, that the New York Post editor, uh, articles about Hunter Biden needed to be flagged, excluded from distribution, or made hard to find. That, to me, seems like you're the ultimate editor. The editorial decision at the New York Post to run the story was overridden by Twitter and Facebook in different fashions to prevent its dissemination. Now, if that's not making an editorial decision, I don't know what would be. It's one thing when we do it in our private lives, uh, Nikki Haley made a post about her concerns about mail-in balloting. It was flagged as uh, something, a claim this hasn't been legitimized. Uh, let me read it to you. The next question to ask is why it a crime to raise doubts about the Holocaust? Why should anyone who writes about such doubts be in prison while insulting uh, the prophet? Is allowed. Now that's the Ayatollah. Uh, he's opining that raising doubts about the Holocaust uh, shouldn't be a crime, and he has openly called for the destruction of Israel. His regime has, and his tweet was basically allowed to flourish. Here's what Nikki Haley said Despite what the media tells us, Election fraud does happen, and policies like balloting, harvesting, and mailing ballots to people who don't request them makes it easier, makes that easier. That needs to stop. This claim about election fraud is disputed. Well, that's her opinion. She believes, like I do, 
that mail-in balloting is uh, ripe for fraud if you can't verify the signature. And if we just send mail ballots out to the world that are not requested and you don't have a signature verification system that can be trusted, you have, in fact, led to harvesting of ballots uh, for nefarious purposes. The question for us as a country, at what point do the decisions by these organizations cross a line? At what point do they have to assume responsibility that Section 230 shields them from? And to the people who are about to testify, I consider your products to have changed the world mostly for the good. We're able to interact among ourselves. We're able to talk to each other and share life experiences. We're able to, in real time, communicate to our neighbors and our friends and those who oppose us what we think with technology that just makes it instantaneous and can literally light up the world. Section 230 was developed to allow these technologies to flourish. Early on, if you could sue Twitter or Facebook for content on a Facebook posting or a tweet and they were liable by, for what somebody else said or what they felt or did, then the company would have probably never been in existence. The companies are trying to help us deal with child pornography. We have the Earn It Act that to be, to be able to maintain liability protections when it comes to sexual exploitation of media sites, social media sites, of sexual predators, this committee has passed a bill saying you can only maintain that uh, liability protection if, in fact, you use best business practices. And that's where I think we need to be going. My hope is that we change Section 230 to incentivize social media platforms to come up with standards that are transparent and opaque that will allow us to make judgments about their judgments, that the fact checkers be known, that the community standards, who sets them, what are their biases, and give some direction to these companies because they have almost an impossible task. They're literally trying to engage in telling us what's reliable and what's not based on cable news commentary or tweets from politicians or average citizens. Nobody in a free society has ever had that responsibility before. And the question is, how do you control that responsibility? I don't want the government to take over the job of telling America what tweets are legitimate and what are not. I don't want the government deciding what content to take up and put down. I think we're all in that category. But when you have companies that have the power of governments, have far more power than traditional media outlets, something has to give. And I'm hoping in this hearing today that we can find a baseline of agreement, that Section 230 needs to be changed, that my bias would be to allow the industry itself to develop best business practices to protect the sites against terrorism and child exploitation and other concerns, that we look at the business practices of these companies through a uh, health prism, that some of their practices need to be modified because it can become addictive. You know, we thought tobacco was a good thing for a long time to the point that we sent it to our soldiers in combat. The more we realized about the addictive nature of tobacco, the more we changed our mind about um, telling the public about the product. So whether or not we do that with social media platforms, that these platforms can be addictive if used too often, I don't know if we need to go there. But I do know that Section 230, it, is, it exists today, is got to give. And I think there's Republican and Democrat concern about the power that's being used by social media outlets to tell us what we can see and what we can't, what's true and what's not, to the extent that Section 230, in my view, has to be rewritten. So that's the purpose of this hearing, 
is to find a way forward to bring about change. And when it comes to social media platforms in Section 230, uh, change is going to come.